He was only 15 when the Nazis deported him and his family to Auschwitz. His mother and younger sister were killed on arrival. He felt his God and his soul died that day also. And all his dreams turned to dust. But the boy and his father were able-bodied and selected for hard labour. They were transferred to Bruckenwald in Germany, where the father died soon after. But the boy survived to be liberated by the US Third Army in 1945. Elie Wiesel was relocated to France for rehab and there studied with Buba and Sartre. He worked as a journalist and published a memoir. He went to America, married, taught philosophy and advocated for human rights. He was eventually awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and a knighthood. His more than 40 books addressed themes that had haunted him since the camps. Faith and suffering, alienation and survival, love and responsibility, God, evil and death. Wiesel thought that the principal cause of human suffering the greatest threat to peace, the true opposite of love, is not hatred so much as simple indifference. In an address on the perils of indifference given at the White House, he explained how easy it is to avert our gaze from victims so they don't interrupt our neat lives. It is, after all, awkward, troublesome to be involved in another person's pain and despair, he said. But such indifference enables sins of neglect. It's also sinful because it treats the victim as of no consequence. Their life, meaningless. Their anguish, of no interest. Indifference reduces the other to an abstraction. So we can ignore the starving child, the political prisoner, the homeless refugee, the unborn, at risk of abortion, the newcomer to our land. Indifference is a sin. It is also a punishment. Wiesel explained, because while some anger is creative, indifference is always deadening. As much as the victim's body, it kills the perpetrator's heart. Long before Wiesel, Jesus warned of the perils of indifference. A rich man had many good things come his way, Amos describes him as sprawling on an ivory divan, gormandizing on fattened calf, surrounded by wine, women, and song. There's a poor man at the gate, starving and ulcerated, to whom only bad things came. Now, Jesus is no party pooper, 
he, in fact, loved to party. But how can you party while a neighbour is starving at your door, he asks. Why not invite him in? Well, Dives didn't. Now both men died. The poor man was carried away by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. Not so the rich man. His unwillingness to recognise and care for Lazarus unsuited him for paradise. Dives ends up in the other place, begging for relief. But he's told there's now a great gulf between himself and Lazarus. When he says, if only I'd known, he's reminded that Moses, Amos and the other prophets had warned Israel again and again. The great gulf between heaven and hell is, of course, about the two radical possibilities in the afterlife. But it also recalls the gulfs we create and perpetuate between rich and poor, secure and insecure, homed and homeless. Our solicitude for others in this life, or neglect of them, has implications for eternity. The Bible begins with friendship. When the Creator gets going, he intimates there's friendship, plurality, even within himself. He says, let us make, not let me make. And when God makes the human person in the divine image, he quickly notices it's not good for the man to be alone. He needs a helpmate. The God in relationship makes humanity for relationship. So friendship is in our spiritual DNA. Our social and ecclesial lives are about collaborating and serving each other like organs of a body. And our ultimate destiny is communion with God and others in the great banquet of heaven. To be indifferent to others as if they don't exist or are mere abstractions or have no purchase on us is to fail to see God in them, is to fail to see another of myself in them. Worse than that, it denies the image of God in oneself, that at core we are made for love. St. Catherine of Siena observed that God could have made us all self-sufficient. But he deliberately made us all deficient in one way or another, so we would need each other. Setting up great gulfs between us and others doesn't just neglect them, it also neglects an important part of ourselves. We put ourselves in the isolation ward of hell even before we die. In today's story, 
Lazarus lies at Dive's gate. So Dive's can't but have noticed him. He had to step over him or around him every time he went out. But Dives was well practiced in ignoring his neighbor's suffering. Perhaps he told himself it wasn't his fault. That it was just the luck of the draw. Or that Lazarus had brought it on himself. Or that the poor man's relatives should look after him. Or the government, or the charities. Whatever excuse he gave himself, it blinkered him to the other's suffering and focused him on his own comfort only and that of a few favoured brothers. It's the kind of thinking that got Amos and all the prophets right up to Jesus very worked up. But we are not doomed to be like that. Paul tells Timothy today that as a man dedicated to God, he should be saintly and religious, faithful and loving, patient and gentle. Not just young bishops like Timothy. Paul thinks all Christians should be full of faith and love. And Christ taught us to have a special care for the poor. On this 108th World Day of Migrants and Refugees, he says, Don't ask when you saw me hungry or homeless. You saw it in all the Lazaruses at your gate. Question is, did you greet me warmly and welcome me in?